So we're about to welcome our next speaker. And like Brooke, he is a Sony artisan of imagery. And for most of you, he'll need little to no introduction. Having worked for National Geographic, among others, and with a body of work that spans the four corners of the globe, Colby Brown is one of the most established travel and landscape photographers today. He's also the founder of the humanitarian effort, The Giving Lens, and he's here today to talk to us about the importance of visual storytelling in an ever-changing industry. So please welcome Colby Brown. All right, can you guys hear me? All right, so we turned on the back piece here. Um, so I'm gonna try to stay away from my shadows getting in the shot, but well, first, I guess let's start off by I wanted to thank Adorama and for all you guys for coming out. And I want to talk about something that's super important right now um, in the photo industry, and it's that idea of visual storytelling. And, and its importance and its significance in a industry that has been changing quite drastically over the last 10 years. So, as it was mentioned, I, I've been doing this professionally for 12 years now. Um, I, I, literally travel anywhere between five to seven months out of the year, constantly um, going into crazy environments, shooting a lot of landscape travel, wildlife, humanitarian, photojournalism. And it was through this process that I realized, um, or, or that things began to click to make sense why, for why visual storytelling was so important. And during that process, as was mentioned, I started an organization called The Giving Lens. And The Giving Lens is a entity that blends the idea of, of how art can work hand in hand to help sustainable development initiatives in developing countries around the world to help fight and champion for different causes such as youth education projects and women's vocational schools and species preservation uh, projects, all sorts of stuff. It's a really great organization. Uh, I always like to give it just a little bit of a plug for those that are interested to find ways to give back through your art form, through your passion for photography. So if you guys have a second after I'm done here, if you have questions about it, or a couple minutes later tonight, check out The Giving Lens. There's a lot of great opportunities around the world to really make a difference through your art. So as I mentioned, photography has changed quite a bit. Um, I think there's no doubt that we can say that between social media and technology, advertising, marketing, publications, everything has shifted and changed a lot in the last 10 to 15 years. And what's happened is that we've moved away from the saying where a photograph used to be a dime a dozen, and now it's more like a dime a billion. And so there's some significance in that and how it plays for the idea of supply and demand, how it matters for interest in this, in this art form, how, pe how people consume your content. And what's happened since photography has kind of blown up with its interest, with smartphone cameras being everywhere, with gear being more affordable and more powerful, software be becoming more accessible, is that a, a strong difference is, has begun to crop up between a snapshot and a photograph. And this right here is a snapshot. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever been to Japan. This is the, the famous uh, Japanese snow monkey park uh, where you can pho photograph uh, the monkeys in these na in this natural hot springs that they form this national park around. And this is a great example where this is a snapshot. It's a moment frozen in time that's meant to encapsulate what was happening. It's, it's uh, you know, generally it's done with our cell phones. Oftentimes these days it's done with our bigger cameras. And it serves a purpose for what it is. But there's a difference between that and a photograph. And to me, the difference between the snapshot and the photograph is intent. Photography with a purpose, for example. And this, is, this has happened from the very beginning of photography. If we look back at the first two photographs ever created back uh, a long, long time ago, both of these two images, the people, the photographers that took these shots, did it for a reason. Now, some of that might have been tied to the size of the cameras they were using, but there's a reason they attempted to point their camera at something and take a photograph. And this is something that I feel that we've lost a little bit in the digital space. Because now, 
we have cameras that can take not only amazing photos, but we have SD cards that can hand, you know, have 5,000, 10,000 images, depending on the size of the megapixels that you're shooting. And a lot of the time, we've lost that idea of photography with a purpose, photography with intent, with taking our time. And for me, that's the, why the idea of visual storytelling helps bring things full circle and come back to what's important. So photographers are visual storytellers, which is obviously a theme with this talk. And it's important because if we look at other art forms, if we look at The Martian, if anyone's, anyone's seen or read the book? A couple of people. It's a great book if you're into science fiction. Um, a really, really great book. Mark Weir wrote it. Um, there was hundreds of pages. It was, it was like 350 pages that he had the ability to tell a story. As an author, you, that, that, that was what he was given. If we look at the movie that Matt Damon starred in, there was 117 minutes long. He, the, the, the director had that much time to create a compelling story to have the audience sit down, feel engrossed, and feel a part of what was happening. Now, as a photographer, you don't have that. You don't have that luxury. Now, some of us, uh, myself included, back in the day, looked towards National Geographic photographers that would take these beautiful uh, photographs that were part of a series of a photo essay, and it maybe told a little bit more of a complete story with threads interconnecting the different photographs. But for the most part, most of us, when it comes to interacting with our friends or our colleagues or people out there on the internet, you have just a single frame to capture someone's attention, to pull them in, and to hopefully tell something that's meaningful, something that's important to you. This is a photograph that I took uh, in Tacloban in the Philippines just four days after the typhoon Yolanda had hit. I'd been working on a project in northern Thailand right when it hit and used some connections, jumped on a supply ship and found my way out there uh, working with some of the teams that were literally pulling bodies out of the water. And I was there for a number of days to document the stories of what was happening and what was going on. And it was this, this, this young boy, this young man, um, lighting up some, uh, some trash on the side at the first night that I got there just captivated me between the colors and what was happening. And conscientiously, or maybe somewhat subconsciously, a lot of the choices that I made out in the field, as well as how I process it, was meant to enhance that story that I was trying to tell. I wasn't just taking the photo to take it. I was taking the photo to share something important. So luckily, even though, that, even though an author has a couple hundred pages and a director has a couple hundred minutes and you are generally stuck with having a single frame to capture someone's attention, the age-old sailing cliche as it may, uh, may be is that a picture is worth a thousand words. And that's going to help you understand a little bit more of where I'm going with this. We're going to kind of dive a little bit into what a story is, why it's important, how it kind of relates as an analogy to your photography work, whether it's images that you guys are taking here at this wonderful B Alpha event or when you guys are out in your own hometowns or traveling around the world or whatever you're doing. So a typical story arc. So your typical story arc, if you think of your standard story, you have a handful of, of common themes. We have our starting point right here where the story begins. You have some sense of a sense of place, a sense of atmosphere, you're kind of understanding who your characters are. You have some sense of rising action. Generally in the movies, things are building up to some sort of confrontational moment. You have this climax, some place where the, the hero generally struggles, has to triumphant over something. Some sense of falling action and ultimately a resolution of some sorts, even if the movie, the book, the story is left, left open-ended. Now, the important thing and why I bring this up in this case is that as a photographer, you're actually only really responsible for these first three. And what I mean by that is that as a, as a creator, as a visual storyteller, you are setting up the scene, you are choosing your subject, you are essentially directing the viewer along some sense of either a pathway or some sense of direction through your image. And the rest of it's up to the audience. It's, rest, it's up to who, who's resonating with your work. You don't have to sit there and create a complete story within a single shot, which is very difficult if you're taking you know, abstract shots of pebbles or, or flowers or something like that. You're just responsible for that first piece because there is so much that 
gets put into the other, the back end of the story, from the, the viewer's experience themselves. How your viewer is feeling that day, how they might be connected towards that specific photograph. And so if we look at this photograph of the Northern Lights, this was taken in Vic in, in Iceland. Now, someone might resonate with this because it inspires a sense of travel, travel lust within them, wanting to travel the world. Maybe it's something, uh, something more on the belief side, something more personal when, you know, when it comes to the church, whether it's the natural phenomena or the colors that initially pulled them in. But regardless, I'm only responsible. I can only control so much of that process. So I'm making cognitive choices when I'm out there in the field. I'm choosing how I'm going to process it, how I'm going to crop it, and how, which medians I'm going to put it out on. But after that point, it's actually up to the people that are viewing it to fill in the rest of what makes this image unique to them. If you guys caught you know, Brooke's speech earlier, she was talking about this, how you as a creator can only do so much. And so it's important in this mindset as a visual storyteller to not get hung up on this mentality that you have to create this complete story, this complete body of work that makes sense to everyone. You need to do as much of what you can, put forth as much energy and effort that you can for those first three pieces, the setting the stage, your composition, your you know, use of lighting and exposure, and we're gonna talk about those things, but just focus on those first few pieces because the rest of it's up to everyone else. So with all that being said, like, where do we start? How do you work on being a better visual storyteller? This initially starts with the process of changing your mindset. Again, it's that notion that you're creating photography for a reason or a purpose. If you guys are out here walking around New York City and you're just taking a picture of something because you think it's pretty, that's not a reason. There's not necessarily something that's drawing you in or pulling you in. You have to change the way that you look at photography. Instead of just taking pictures because you can, you should ask yourself why. I've realized over the years of doing this for 12 years that the longer that I've actually been a photographer, the less I have my camera out because I'm more particular on what I'm trying to capture and how I'm trying to capture it. So another thing that's gonna really help you is to photograph things that you're passionate about. Now for me, as I was, uh, it was mentioned when I got introduced, I love landscape work. Like I love the, the, uh, the, the solitude and the intimate nature that I get with Mother Nature when I'm out traveling the world, going to places that are unique and remote and off the beaten path. There's something about it that kind of pulls me in, that inspires me, and so I care more about it. Same thing with travel. I originally got into photography because of, I had this love of travel, this love of experience. I didn't have some nostalgic story where I've always wanted to take a photograph or my father gave me a camera when I was seven and it's just what I've always been destined to do. Like, that's not my story. My story is about being addicted to the idea of how the experience of life is unique and different, and I want to capture that. And so photography became that, that vehicle or that median to allow me to continue to experience the world and share those unique experiences with people that would never have that opportunity otherwise. And the same thing for wildlife. To me, there's something uniquely challenging about wildlife where Unlike working in a studio where you have a model that has, you know, that you can communicate with and you can direct in some form or fashion, there's, there's a challenging aspect of wildlife that is, that is uniquely innate to that genre of photography because while there is somewhat, some form of communication between you and a wild animal, it's a much different level than what you get when you're interacting with other human beings. So I love the challenge and the patience that it requires. And because of that, I'm willing to Put, more, put forth more effort. I'm willing to travel to more places. I'm willing to spend more money. And that's important because if we come back to, to you guys, and the really easy example of this is a landscape photographer, a photographer that loves shooting the outdoors, that is forced to shoot, say, weddings to make a living. Now, if I look at a portfolio at an event like this, and you guys, and, and say that was you, I can most likely instantly tell where your passion is because you direct your focus, you put your forth your energy, and you put everything into what you care about. If you're doing something just to make a paycheck, that's a different story. So when it comes to this idea of visual storytelling, focus on things that you care about, that you, that you, that you, you want to be there photographing from the, to, from the beginning. 
Because otherwise, it's going to be obvious for most people that at least have an eye for this, that you're not, your heart's not in it. So as cliche as that is, like photograph things that you care about, photograph things that you love, that move you, that inspire you, because you'll, you'll care more and you'll put more into it. Study your environment. This is another thing I said. Now, again, I'm a, I do landscape and travel, so a lot of this stuff is wrapped around that. But taking your time to know your environment or your subjects that you're photographing, slow down, essentially, is a great tool or technique to adopt in a digital world where you can come to a place like Iceland. This is Gadafoss in northern Iceland. And see, this night, there was like six hours of lenticular 360-degree you know, fire in the sky colors. And I spent at least 15, 20 minutes when I first got there, like camera away, sitting down, getting a feel for the environment, for what was happening, to see where my eye was being drawn, to really take my time to get to know what I was trying to photograph. And I do the same thing when I photograph people as well, especially when I travel. Like I don't want to show up into a remote tribe in, in Namibia or Uganda with a camera in hand. I want to have my camera away in my backpack. I want to have conversations. I want to take my time to get to know who I'm trying to photograph or what I'm trying to photograph because it opens more doors and it also allows me to think a little bit more slowly, a little bit more thoughtfully, a little bit more purposefully. Establish your protagonist. Now, it's kind of a mouthful to say protagonist, but in reality, I'm actually surprised at how many people aren't actually thinking through that process of establishing what is the focus of the image that you're trying to take. As basic as it sounds, it's a little bit more intrinsic than, let's say you're taking a picture of, uh, this is a panoramic shot in Patagonia. It's not just that there was beautiful colors or there was a reflection, like what was it about this that drew me in that wanted me to take, take the image to begin with? Now this image was taken on an, a Sony A7R Mark III with a 24-70 to f2.8 GM lens, which some of you guys may have rented. The reason I mention that is that this scene, once I got there and realized what was happening, called for a panorama. So I immediately changed the gear that I was using to switch over to something that I felt was a composition that played much more towards the story of what I was trying to tell. Something that was much more endemic for that subject matter because I identified the reflections and the light and how it was happening. It wasn't just that it was beautiful. I was trying to isolate and figure out why it was beautiful to me. And that changed the choices I made out there in the field. Now, the same thing can be said for different types of subjects. This is the Grand Prismatic Geyser taken uh, from a, a plane that I rented um, in Yellowstone National Park. Now, this is something that I've been eyeing and doing for years. Finally had to carve out some time in my calendar, actually just a few months ago. But getting up there in the sky, taking the time to understand what I was going to photograph, changed the gear I was going to use, it changed the exposures I was going to use, it changed all the different parts of it. And if you think about it from that perspective, the initial choice that you make that determines what you're trying to capture and why it's important to you is kind of like your point of origin for your story. And if you think about it, that origin point should dictate and change every single other choice you make in the field and how you process your images ultimately. So that you have some sort of combination between your in-field thoughts and when you are processing your images so that those two kind of become one thought process. There's a thread that connects everything together. And I feel that a lot of the times these days, there's this disconnect between the two. We go out and we shoot here or we shoot you know, uh, you know, the Brooklyn Bridge, or we're, we're going to places like Iceland, or wherever we're going, and we, we photograph, and we have this mentality, this mindset of what we're trying to do. And then we get home, and we've forgotten all of that. We forgot the feeling of what it was like being in these locations, or what, it th what, we, what we felt like, what, 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 what was going through our head. And then we process it with this completely different space. And there's that disconnect that I feel makes it much harder to tell that, that, that engaging or interesting story. Now, the irony out of me saying that is that I am backlogged by oftentimes years when it comes to like photograph, you know, catching up on images that I've taken around the world. But for whatever reason, it's hard for me maybe to remember my own birthday, but I can very easily tell you what it felt like being up there with the window open, standing over the Grand Prismatic, and remembering and harnessing that, that emotion, that feeling, that thought process and then processing that image out that ties directly back to those original ideas. Same thing happens when it comes to photographing people. This was in Papua New Guinea uh, in Australia earlier this year. And I was in a very remote 
segment of, um, of Papua New Guinea uh, in a place called the Sepik region. I had to take a charter plane to get there, and then I had to take a couple day boat ride in order to get to a few of these specific uh, villages with people that didn't speak languages and rarely saw other people that looked like myself as a 6'3 white bald guy. And, and work to make a connection and figure out what it was about the subjects that I found entertaining or that I found interesting that, that, that was pulling me into what was happening. And this particular individual was uh, one of the, the leaders of this particular village that I was visiting, and I instantly made a connection with him when I walked up. I realized between how we were looking at her and what was happening, so I waited for the ceremonies of what, was, was, uh, what I was there to document and took some time afterwards and through a translator got to know him a little bit he opened up a little bit, and then I kind of pulled him to his side and asked him to take his photograph. And between the light, once I realized where I pulled him aside, how the light was changing, I was able to kind of harness in on what was it about him that really drew me in. And if you look at this image, any guesses on, on what that might have been? The, well, the hair definitely. To me, the hair more frames the photo. It definitely is a part of it, but it was his eyes. And they were like a crazy green. It was amazing. Now, there's a little bit of reflection and stuff happening here as well, but it was just the, this unique part of what was happening. I wanted to make sure that the choices that I was making there, the, the idea of my aperture, my composition, all those pieces came together because I isolated exactly what it was about this individual that was pulling me in. It wasn't just that he was beautiful or that it would make a good travel photograph. There was something unique and different about him and then his relationship to me that if I took a, this type of photograph with most of the other males that were in this village, it would not have come out as great because I didn't have that personal connection with those other individuals as I did this guy. So frame your story. So if we've already established the fact that we're isolating some sort of subject matter, we're determining what we're trying to photograph, framing your stories where composition is kind of like setting almost like your plot line, if we use the analogy. So this is a photograph of a fisherman taken in uh, Myanmar. And um, you, the choice of negative space, the choice of using a really shallow aperture, the choice of framing this with his hands exactly where they were placed, making sure there was a little bit of space for his hat for, uh, at the top part, all were intentional. And this is the mindset I want you guys to get back to, this idea that you're not just trying to do things because you think they look good, but because they're, they're helping take your image or, or the idea that you're trying to do and, and, and raise it up to a new level. Oh. There we go. So this is taken in Antelope Canyon in uh, northern Arizona. And the reason I use this as an example for framing is because when I was in the Slot Canyon in, in, in Lower Antelope Canyon, and I looked up at this one scene, there was just so many layers, it felt like almost like an onion to, to, um, uh, for an analogy. And what happened was that when I looked up initially, there was a, there's a break in the canyon, it's these, these soft sandstone canyons, there's a break and there's all this harsh light coming in. So I ducked myself underneath this little lip and tried to frame it where I got the most amount of those layerings without any blown highlights and use some natural framing here in the bottom. And that allowed things to kind of come together and create something that's a little bit more different. Something that, that allowed for that, that natural composition to tell and feel more engaging because if there was a bright hot spot in that top right hand corner, if I was back further in, like those compositions weren't the best composition that exemplified the idea of the subject of this photograph. So it's, it, it, it was intent behind that. Same thing, again, coming back to Patagonia. I spent six or seven days camping out by this lake, waiting for light to be like this at Torre. And the morning that this launched and everything came together, I found these beautiful little um, icebergs here on the, on the right, little heart-shaped here, and I wanted to include them in my shot. I could, I could photograph this a million different ways. But there was something about giving the object space, letting your, your, your subject have some breathing room, bringing everything together to kind of add a little bit of depth. And I, I find that a, a image that has something that's interesting to say, that has a poor composition, is kind of like seeing a bad movie. 
Like if you, if you think about that from an analogy standpoint, if you go to a movie theater and you see a movie and like the plot line just doesn't make sense, right? Like you don't know where characters are coming from, you don't know where, what role they're playing in, you don't really know how to follow the story. And the same thing happens with a good composition or a bad composition. So thinking about your compositions in terms of not only setting your place in, in a little bit of your atmosphere, but also just about that idea that it's like, it, it's your, your plot line, so to speak. You're, you're, you're choosing how to present your story, and if you're trying to do too much, then typically it becomes too convoluted. The viewers don't know where to, where to look. And we'll talk a little bit about simplifying here in a second as well. Simplifying your images. So the reason that I bring this up is that it's really easy in a lot of different art forms to want to include everything. You guys come here and there's like all this stuff happening around this room right now. And it's really easy to kind of get brought up in, in you know, the hoopla, the distractions. But that's ultimately what they become. The idea that you want to simplify your composition, you want to, to isolate what it is your subject matter, find a composition that exemplifies that and raises that bar for that subject. And then you want to, you want to take away all the distractions. You want to isolate and simplify your work because it's much easier for people to follow. Looking at this, you guys have an idea of what's important here. You guys have an idea of what I'm trying to share with you. This was taken uh, again in Iceland in an ice cave. And most people down there, other photographers that were there with me, we all had you know, maybe a 24 or 12 to 24 lens, 16 to 35 lens. They were trying to bring everything in, everything was going on. And to me, it was this isolated piece of ice that was dropping down from uh, the ceiling of this ice cave that it really stood out to me. And the fact that it was so dark behind it allowed me to isolate it, separate all the other distractions, all the other complications, and really come away with something that was unique. Same thing here, this is in Yosemite National Park. Um, these are our dogwood uh, uh, plants, or dogwood tree, right along the Merced River in Yosemite Valley, using my macro lens, and instead of worrying about the crazy, the underbrush of what was happening underneath it, I chose an exposure that blacked it out, and then isolated a couple different pieces, a few different leaves, and one of the blooming flowers, so that I could isolate and separate all the other distractions out. The number one thing that I, when I look at people's work that oftentimes feels too complicated is the advice I tell is to simplify. Don't try to do too much. Don't always try to include everything in your shot. And oftentimes, again, that comes from that idea or that mentality of not isolating out what you're trying to photograph to begin with. If you're doing street photography here in New York and you see something that's happening that's unique, isolate that story from other, other chaos unless that other chaos is playing towards your story you're trying to tell. Help direct the viewer. These, again, more compositional techniques, if you want to use it. That's usually how they're educated or, or how people explain them. But it's this mentality that you as the artist, you as the photographer, have the ability to direct the viewer throughout your frame. And this is important because if, if people are viewing your stuff on Instagram and they're sliding through your Instagram wheel, or maybe you have a gallery show, or maybe you have a website, if your viewer doesn't know how to follow along with what you're trying to show them, they've already lost interest. Like people have like nanoseconds to capture someone's attention. And so using things like natural framing, I used the, the Sony 12 to 24, which again, some of you guys might have rented here, stuck it inside this, this fisherman's net and took what I felt was a much more unique shot than just the standard shot of these fishermen here in Inlay Lake in Myanmar. And to me, that helped tell something that was unique and different. And yes, it was a little bit more of a contrived shot because I envisioned what was happening, but it helps isolate. You know, it's not difficult to know where to look. And in doing so, I also created quite a bit of depth in this image throughout that process. Helping the viewer know exactly where to look, where to, to direct them from, from my standpoint. This is really easy in landscape work when you're using wide angle lenses and you're using vertical shots. Being able to use things like leading lines or natural formations such as uh, the, the ebb and flow of a tide. I was in Norway and this is back in Iceland. And using those things to help, help give the viewer some visual cues to know exactly where they're looking and what you're trying to show them. Because if I took this same shot here of, of this waterfall and I was more over to the right and you couldn't really see the water flowing in, it kind of breaks that flow. 
and doesn't give a reason for the, f for the viewer to kind of follow through the shot and see everything that's happening here. And once you do that, they see other details that they would have otherwise missed. So as you're following the waterfall and you're starting to see these rocks and these rapids and the green, and it flows out here and you see these cars or other photographers that were there at the shot, this town in the background. Those are details they probably would have missed otherwise, but because you gave them a reason to look through the rest of your shot, they're gonna pick up things that maybe even you missed, but regardless, they've now taken a couple seconds out of their day to kind of follow along and be more ingrained with what you're trying to do. So using light to control atmosphere and emotion. Now, oftentimes they say that photography is really about chasing and capturing light, and I imagine most of us would agree. And it's important to understand that if you're shooting in one of the program modes or if you're shooting in one of the priority modes, the aperture priority or shutter speed priority, your camera is constantly trying to give you a correct exposure based on your light meter, based on your light meter setting and how, how your, your sensor is interpreting that light. And the reason that it's important to understand this is that every single image has a minimum of six different correct exposures to photograph, and, that, and that's, that's giving you balanced light. Now, when you take the reality that a scene like this, what do you think the histogram is going to look like on an image like this? It's going to look like Moses was parting the water. You're going to have super dark shadows with your, your histogram on the left. You're going to have some really bright, oftentimes blown out highlights. But this was the correct exposure for the shot that I was going for. So the reason that I bring this up is that once you begin to learn to harness the idea of either shooting in manual mode or at least taking advantage of the, using the, the priority modes as well as your using exposure, uh, exposure compensation to adjust for it, you can get really creative and use light to really enhance the atmosphere of your images. If this image was properly exposed, exposed there'd be much less contrast and there'd be no balance between the significance of the light and the shadows and the light on the monk's face. So think creatively about how you're using light, how light should help play a role in the story that you're trying to tell, how the, the light helps dictate how people feel about the shots that you're trying to show them. Same thing happens here in, in Norway, this, uh, in Lofoten Islands in Norway uh, with the Northern Lights. So, the reason that I use this image as an example is that if you look at the shot, all of the foreground here is quite lit up. Any ideas of how that happened? Did I, did I just jump up the shadow slider and, and play with the exposure slider and paint in some stuff? I planned this trip around the, the moon. I wanted the moon to be out knowing that I was going to go photograph the northern lights, knowing that I was at a high enough uh, um, at latitude to be able to still have this, the, the moon behind me, knowing that it was going to light up the foregrounds for the areas that I wanted to photograph. And yes, I got lucky with the weather and things came together, but it was intentional. I was using light to create a certain kind of image, natural organic light from the moon mixed in with a natural phenomena like the northern lights. And those two pieces came together to create something that's much more unique to me than if the moonlight wasn't there and you just had dark shadows down here in the bottom. So it was intentional use of, uh, of, of light to help that story I was trying to tell. Same thing here back in Iceland in an ice cave. Being there early morning, using that early morning light, bouncing and uh, lighting off of, of the ice that had been you know, there for thousands of years, and how that light, early morning light reflected and lit everything up. The intentional use of light to help you you know, get people more interested in your work, to feel more engaged with what you're trying to show them is important. Oftentimes, again, I feel that we're disconnected from that. We, we, we use light because we think it's pretty or that it's nice, not, be, not for a reason outside of maybe capturing someone's attention. So using it to help play a story or help play a role in the story that you're trying to, to create, to use it as an element of your story. So creatively capturing motion. So if we think of light overall as a control of atmosphere and the feeling of your shot, you can think of motion and the use of your shutter speed to dictate tension or a dreamlike state. Now this is a very high shutter speed taken of a hummingbird actually at my house in eastern Pennsylvania. And 
I, I, I used, I think it was like one four thousandth of a second, and, and this hummingbird was really going, so obviously there's still movement in the wings, and that gives off a different feel than if it was stopped down totally and totally frozen in time. And if you contrast that to something like this, which, is a two, which I think actually was a four second exposure uh, taken in a waterfall in the winter time, and it gives us a very different feeling, a very different thought. Now I teach a lot of workshops around the world and I constantly get people coming up to me and are like, what settings do I use? And my number one you know, answer in a place like this is like, well, what are you trying to capture? What are you trying to photograph? What is drawing you in? For me, it was getting super close to this waterfall and having these streams flow in and this crazy blue glacier silt water all come together created something that was unique and different to me as an individual. So if I took this shot at you know, one fifth of a second, there'd be too much movement in the water for more of the dreamlike look that I was going for. So it was intentional. I, I, I went through this process and in my head, by now it's a little bit more subconsciously because I've done this for so many years, but I'm, I'm going through these check boxes in my head of like, what's important to me? What am I trying to convey? I'm selecting the subject that pulls me in. I'm figuring out a composition that elevates that idea of the subject. I'm using light to kind of bring pieces together to make people feel some sort of emotional reaction or feel like there's more engaging aspects of it. And then I'm using shutter speed to help dictate how motion, if I want to have tension or smoothness throughout people when they look at my images. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, that's what I want. I want an emotional reaction out of you. If I don't get an emotional reaction out of you, whether it's overt and you actually smile or maybe you frown or, or have fear if it's something that's in one of my photojournalistic types of images. I want that emotional reaction because that's gonna stop you in your tracks. That's gonna stop you scrolling through Instagram, figuring out, you know, coming to my website, seeing one of my images on Times Square. I want that reaction and those reactions are intentional. There's a reason I, I make these choices out in the field and how I process my shots. Coming back to things like scale and perspective, an image like this taken in Patagonia is not the same if it wasn't for the guy that was hiking through the mountains. It adds a sense of grandiosity, of, of overall size and grandeur of the natural world, of what I was trying to capture here. The image, is, it, it's nice if the guy wasn't in it, but it's exponentially better. You can envision yourself being that person or seeing this shot because there's something for you to connect to as a human being. I use, the same, I, I use people as an example because it, it, it's great to have a universal size guide, so to speak, uh, as another human being. Even if you don't know their exact height, you know that a human being is so high. So if you look at this shot, this is actually the same waterfall taken in Iceland two different times a year, two different angles. So this is actually my assistant down here in the bottom and just gave a little bit of a sense of perspective of what was happening. You kind of get a little bit of a feel for how big the waterfall and what's going on. I think it was taken with like a 24 to 70. And then this image was taken in winter time, probably a year later. And you see this photographer in this beautiful red jacket standing against the contrast of the snow, taken from behind the waterfall with an ultra wide angle lens. Gives you a very different feel between the two images. Now you can also use other no, you know, noticeable uh, sized objects to help give you a sense of, of scope or, or size perspective. But in these two situations, I thought it was a great example to show you how you can create unique and, and different types of images and let people know just how amazing these locations are and how big they truly are in comparison to everything else that we normally see. So details matter. Now this is a gold dust uh, gecko taken in Hawaii on the big island. And the reason that I use this image is because obviously it's very detailed. It was taken with the, the 90 millimeter Sony macro lens uh, back in the, I think it was the first generation A7R. And there's so many beautiful details of what's happening back here. Actually, the reason I really got drawn to this particular gecko that was outside my hotel was because if you actually look at this and you flip this up, it actually almost looks like the, the continents of the world on its back. It's really kind of cool. But the reason that I use it in this example is because details are important. And I feel that oftentimes we overlook those details. And so a really great mindset that I recommend you guys think about, which is really really important in the digital A's because the vast majority of you guys don't actually see your images in print anymore. Most of the stuff you guys see are, are, are constantly lives in the digital space. So whether it's on your phone or your tablet or your computer or you're sending things to Instagram or Facebook, the vast majority of photographers these days don't actually get anything printed anymore. 
But regardless of that, and I highly recommend you guys look into that, but regardless of that, I go in when it comes to shooting and processing my images with the mindset that every single photograph is gonna be blown up into a six foot by four foot ratio. The reason that I do that is that if I'm looking at this image on the back of my camera, which is what, about like three inches in space, it's gonna look great most of the time. Most images we take at three inches looks great, right? Maybe there's a few small distracting elements, super tiny on a three inch screen. All of a sudden that same image, you load it up onto your, your tablet or your iPad. All of a sudden you're on a 10 inch screen and you're like, okay, well I notice, you know, maybe there's a small little piece here in the corner. It gets a little bit bigger. Then all of a sudden you look on a, maybe on a 24 inch screen or a 32 inch screen at home. Then all of a sudden you take that image and you blow it up to six feet by four feet. And that little small distracting piece that you thought wasn't a big deal, now your image got licensed and it's sitting there in, in Times Square and it's, you know, 20 feet tall. And that one distracting detail that you didn't care about is now the size of me. So having that mentality of going through how you process your image or how you shoot when you're out there in the field, as well as how you process your images, it really pays to, to, to pay attention to those details, to think about those choices that you're making, to remove distracting subjects if that's uh, within your wheelhouse or if that's part of what you do as a creative. But really pay attention and know that the details matter because other people are gonna notice them. So, and know your camera sensors. I'm almost done here, I'm not sure. I think we've probably already gone over a little bit, but know your camera sensors. So, Sony sensors are known for their dynamic range. Most of you guys here are playing with Sonys. Maybe you're shooting other things, that's perfectly fine. But what's really interesting to me is that I find that when I'm out there in the field, I'm constantly working with the strengths and the weaknesses of the gear that I'm using. I've taken the time to know my gear. And the reason that I use this image as an example is this was actually taken again during the first generation of the A7R series. So this was the A7R taken in Yosemite National Park uh, and Tunnel View. And at the time, I had I'd just come from another camera manufacturer where I used to bracket all my shots when I was doing landscape because I needed more dynamic range. They didn't handle, my old manufacturer didn't handle shadows so well. So I bracketed this image with a three shot bracket and for whatever reason, I think maybe I hit my tripod, maybe it was windy that day, but the only image that came out tack sharp was the longest exposure, which was quite surprising. You'd think that the longer exposure on a tripod had more options for wind shake or vibrations, but the other two ones were slightly off. This one was tack sharp. Now, if you were going through, you're processing your images on a trip to Yosemite and you came across this image, would you think that you would want to process it? Would you think that it was salvageable, that you could do something with it? At a time, I would say absolutely no. And I started playing with the raw files and like being able to pull those, those details back really helped me. So even though I had a good idea of the use of atmosphere and light and general exposure for in my head of what I wanted to capture, when it actually came to capturing in the field, I made a mistake or there was some sort of natural occurrence that caused the other two, ones, the other two uh, examples that probably would have been a better exposure for it to not work out. But because I was able to play with those files, it gave me much more latitude to continue to take something, to continue to create something that to me was quite special. So regardless of what you're shooting, whether it's Sony or something else, know what gear you have, know its strengths and, and limitations, and use that when you're out there in the field to create your images, as well as when you're processing your shots and trying to create the other side of that story. So the last little thing that I'll end on here is saying that there are no rules. Now, whoever said that there's uh, you know, the golden rule of photography or, or the idea that you, you need to shoot in the thirds, I, I, I can't stand the fact that there was the, the name rule put into that. Like, there are no rules to photography. Sometimes I wanna break the rules. I don't want complete symmetry. Sometimes I wanna isolate subjects and have things in obtuse or weird places because I feel that it, it plays the, the best for what I'm trying to, to share, to what I'm trying to create. So don't get tied up too much as you're learning that you have to stick within these boundaries of what's possible or what you can do. As long as you're thinking proactively throughout the process and you're, you're creating images that have something to say, you're on the right pathway. So ending, I just wanna reiterate that idea of photography with a purpose. Don't shoot just because you can. Shoot because there's something important, something you're trying to share with everyone else out there in the world.
and that's it. So. Thank you.